All right, well, it's good to see everybody. Um, I, I greeted some of y'all, some of y'all I, I did not yet, but greetings to everybody else that I didn't greet. Um, yeah, I had the uh, participants window up, so I didn't see everybody when they popped in. But it is, uh, again, good to see everybody. It's been way too long. Today, we're going to uh, continue our basis of the BCP class with the order for the burial of the dead. And you can find this on page 324 in the prayer book. So um, in your prayer books, do pull up page 324. And as you're doing that, um, as always, uh, going to talk a little bit of the history of the right. Um, as I said before I start recording, we are going to we are going to be ha have some more interaction uh, this time. Um, I'm hoping anyway, and this might spill over into a second week, but I hope not. I hope we can get it done today. So, um, in terms of history, uh, uh, again, um, one of, one of my primary sources for this is Massey Shepherd and his uh, mid 20th century kind of definitive work on the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. But Shepherd says that um, among the early Christians, kind of in the patristic era. Um, generally when it came to funeral rites, what we, what we mostly just saw was, um, communion. You'd have, you'd have a special Eucharist, a special mass for, um, in memory of the person that died. And then often on the anniversary of that death as well. And so it was kind of seen almost like celebrating their birthday into, into heaven kind of stuff. I mean, that, that was, that was a lot of the, the focus. And really, in terms of kind of the, the liturgies involved, the readings chosen, the focus really was on the joys of um, the joys and the hope of the resurrection. So it was really focused on, um, yes, there was mourning for those left behind, but it was really all about the joys of the resurrection, what we have to look forward to. Um, as we start to move out of that period and into the Middle Ages, kind of that border time, um, we start to see uh, some of the practices get a little bit more complicated. You start to add other prayers and, and processions, different offices and that sort of thing start to develop. And it really reaches its most complex form in the Middle Ages. And you also see in the Middle Ages, not just a complexity of the liturgy, like there, there was a lot of detail as to what you're going to do here, what you're going to do there, a lot of different offices, depending on the situations, you also start to see a focus changing in the Middle Ages. And so the focus changes from um, the joys of hoping in the resurrection to almost a dread of judgment, and you start to see um, a lot more prayers for the dead. Now, prayers for the dead do show up way before the Middle Ages, but that becomes the focus in the Middle Ages. What do you think, just kind of as you, at what, either taking a wild guess or thinking through some church history, might have been the catalyst, that, that kind of theological development that happens in the Middle Ages that leads to this change in focus. Um, any, anyone, anybody want to hazard a guess on that? The only thing, only thing I can think of is the Reformation. Uh, well, well, that's before the Reformation. We're talking. We're talking Middle Ages before, before the Reformation. Yeah. And I'm thinking yeah. of the plagues, bubonic plague. Except I don't think that really had to do with it. But that's the main thing that I can think of that was so calamitous for the, those years. Um, and, and that may have had something to do with it. But really, what we see the biggest theological issue is that we have the development of the doctrine of purgatory in the Western Church. Mm -hmm. Now, now the focus is on praying for the souls that they believed were in purgatory rather than on the hope of the resurrection. This, of course, is something that the reformers um, are very much against. So going to, going to what, uh, what Randy said. Yeah, the reformers are very much against this idea of pur purgatory. They, they don't see any warrant in it in scripture. Um, and they do see that it does damage to um, 
to, to faith, especially in the way that it was seen in the Middle Ages, kind of on a popular level, purgatory was really seen almost as um, a, um, like a better neighborhood of hell <laughs> that, that you could hope to get out of one day. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really the way it was seen. I mean, you have the, this, a lot of language of the fires of purgatory, the time and in torments, you know, as you're getting, as you're getting purified and that sort of thing. And, but it is important to remember that even in the middle ages, despite those kind of weird popular level, um, um, you know, better neighborhood of hell type of ways they, they looked at it. Uh, purgatory was always, um, and the idea was that it was always for the faithful, for those that did die in friendship with God and in, 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 in the fellowship of the church, because it, the idea was that um, if you weren't quite ready for heaven when you die, the Lord's going to purge you out of that. And that's what, that's how the doctrine of purgatory develops. But it develops beyond that simple idea of the Lord's going to purge you of your sins into a lot of weird mythology um, and a lot of a lot of weird ideas. Um, and to be fair, in, in modern Roman Catholicism, they have downplayed a lot of that that those medieval ideas. Um, for well-informed Catholics today, purgatory is almost their version of assur assurance of salvation. You know, they know that they're not doing so hot, but that they see purgatory as a way that God's going to give them the grace to ultimately <laughs> obtain heaven, even though they don't deserve it. Um, we, we as, we as um, sons of the Reformation would still have major issues with that, but um, it's, you know, a lot of the abuses of the Middle Ages have been um, at least for well-informed Catholics, they have been corrected. So that's, that's the big change that happens in the Middle Ages. And as I said, the reformers were highly against this. And so they simplify the burial offices and they really go back to that patristic focus where we're focusing on the Reformation. Um, just like with our last several rites, um, you know, baptism, marriage, uh, not baptism, but less, less so baptism, but definitely marriage, um, uh, anointing of the sick and some of those other, those other rites, we do see a lot of developments and a lot of changes um, to the burial services over the centuries. And that's just within the Western church. That's not just, you know, us going through the Reformation, but that's just period. We just see a lot of changes. So in our liturgy, and which again begins on page 324 in your 1928 prayer book, our liturgy really has two main parts. It begins with the burial office. So that's the order for the burial of the dead. So the burial office. And then it concludes with the burial itself, which is done at the grave. So you have the office done in the church and then the burial done at the grave. We also have in our prayer book, um, we have readings for doing a, what would have been called in the Middle Ages, a requiem mass, a funeral mass, uh, Holy Communion for the funeral. Again, going back to that patristic pattern. Um, well, what happens in the development of the prayer book, backing up just a little bit, in the first prayer book of 1549, all you had was a very simple office and a requiem mass. Um, in 1552, they get rid of the requiem mass because they thought it still had a lot of medieval baggage to it. Um, and then again, for us, by the time we get to the 1928, we do have options for both of those things. Um, so, and, and again, in, in our prayer book, the placement of this, of the burial service is very logical, right? We began after communion office, we began with baptism um, and we went into confirmation. We went into, from there into marriage, then into um, visitation and communion of the sick, and finally into burial. It follows that typical life pattern of someone that is raised in the church. Um, and again, remember that the prayer book, while it was used even evangelistically, um, especially in, in the American colonial period, um, it really is designed with a Christian society, a generally Christian society in mind. Um, the classical prayer books are not 
overtly designed as evangelism tools, although they were used that way um, by, by folks that went along with the British colonies. So let's turn to page 324 and, and look at our service itself. And again, if you have any, any, any questions, comments, do pop in and, and I will have some, I will be asking you all some reflection questions as we go through. So it begins with this section that says, I am the resurrection of the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Um, you'll notice the rubric says the minister meeting the body and going before it, either into the church um, or toward the grave shall say or sing. So what we have here is um, this is kind of a, prof a processional anthem that's made up of different sentences of scripture. Um, so uh, we do, I believe, if memory serves, have some hymn settings of that in, in our prayer book. Um, I don't know any of them. Um, yeah, I, I never did. We, we have settings for a bunch of different stuff for the funeral office, but, but yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I don't know any of them. That's one area of my chanting and singing that, that I have not developed. Um, but, but yeah, these sentences of scripture, we have these passages from Job primarily, but not only from Job. Um, this next sentence is, I know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not as a stranger. So that first sentence is from, from Jesus himself, the second sentence from Job. Um, and then I believe this, this, is, um, this is also from Job, this third sentence. We brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out of it. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So these paraphrases from Job and from the Gospels. After this processional um, anthem, hymns, uh, canto of scriptures, as it were, we have uh, a selection of psalms. And we end up with a choice of six psalms. And this is where, and this is where, um, uh, feel free to, uh, to, to, to chime in here. Um, let's look at this first one. This is Psalm 39. And again, page 324. And so it goes like this. Lord, let me know mine end and the number of my days, that I may be certified how long I have to live. Behold, thou hast made my days as it were a span long, and mine age is even as nothing in respect of thee. And verily, every man living is altogether vanity. For man walketh in a vain shadow, and disquieteth himself in vain. He heapeth up riches, and cannot tell who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what is my hope? Truly, my hope is even in thee. Deliver me from all mine offenses, and make me not a rebuke unto the foolish. When thou with rebukes dost chasten man for sin, thou makest his beauty to consume away like as it were a moth fretting a garment. Every man therefore is but vanity. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and with thine ears consider my calling. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. O spare me a little that I may recover my strength before I go thence and be no more seen. Okay, so here's, here's the question. Um, what are some themes in this psalm that relate to... Um, dying and burying and the Christian hope of the resurrection, that sort of thing. What are some things in the Psalm that you see? Go ahead, Delaney. Um, that's talking about numbering his days, having hope in the Lord, that all is vanity, he walks within the shadow, and that he's getting chastised for sin and asking him to hear his prayer before he goes over. Yeah, so we have this, we have this focus on our mortality, right? Um, uh, you know, you know your mortality. Um, you know, there's, you know, the hope is obviously in the Lord, for, um, asking for forgiveness of sins. All of these things are very important when we look at a burial office. Okay, same question. Let's look at the next psalm. And, and we're not, we're not going to belabor all these because there's six of them, but, but definitely any, anybody feel free to, uh, after we read this psalm, to, to, to chime in. Um, this is Psalm 90, page 325. Lord, thou hast been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever the earth and the world were made, thou art God from everlasting and world without end. 
Thou turnest man to destruction, and again thou sayest, Come again, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. As soon as thou scatterest them, they are even asleep, and fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green, and groweth up, but in the evening it is cut down, dried up, and withered. For we consume away in thy displeasure, and are afraid of thy wrathful indignation. Thou hast set our misdeeds before thee, and our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For when thou art angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end, as it were a tale that is told. The days of our age are threescore years and ten. And though men be so strong that they come to fourscore years, yet is their strength then but labor and sorrow, so soon passeth it away, and we are gone. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So what do you all think in terms of themes and how this relates to uh, the burial of the dead, the hope of the resurrection? You know, I was looking at that verse when I turned 70 and I said, well, anything over 70 is gravy. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> it's interesting that uh, when it comes to human beings the appropriate measure is years and gen generations but when it comes to god the appropriate measure is everlasting to everlasting okay so, we get some perspective going on yeah, there. That's, that's, that's really good yeah. yeah our life is transitory but god is constant mm -hmm. yeah yeah, very good. And um, yeah, and again, we do have this, this hint of the forgiveness of sins. Let's look at the next one. Psalm 27. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? One thing I have desired of the Lord, which I will require, that even, even that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the fair beauty of the Lord and to visit his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his tabernacle. Yea, in the secret place of his dwelling shall he hide me and set me upon a rock of stone. And now shall he lift up mine head above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his dwelling an oblation with a great gladness. I will sing and speak praises unto the Lord. Hearken unto my voice, O Lord, when I cry unto thee. Have mercy upon me and hear me. My heart hath talked of thee. Seek ye my face. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Well, hide not thou thy face from me, nor cast thy servant away in displeasure. Thou hast been my succor, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. I should utterly have fainted, but that I believe verily to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. O tarry thou the Lord's leisure, be strong, and he shall comfort thine heart, and put thou thy trust in the Lord. Okay, again, same question. How does this relate to resurrection and the burial of the dead? Switching over to the other page to see if I see uh, hands being raised, even though um, you all can just unmute. It is, it is referring to the, uh, it does talk, it, a lot of it to me is referring to experiencing the goodness of God in, in this age, you know, while we're living. You know, mm -hmm. about uh, land of the living to see the goodness of God, but it does talk, it does mention the light and my salvation. Uh, you know, the psalmist recognizes that God is his salvation. So there's, there's that reference. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I think there's... you could also. Sorry. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I guess I'm thinking that verse about all the days of my life could also be like a longing for being able to be with the Lord forever. Um because yeah. it's saying that you desire of the Lord and that you require it, right? That you want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life. And we know that we don't dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our life unless, you know, I mean, physically, right? But this particular promise could extend into eternity. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, real, that's a really good point. I mean, and, you know, contextually in the Psalms, when he's talking about the house of the Lord, what's he talking about? He's talking about the temple, the tabernacle. He's talking about... Um, you know, worshiping the Lord uh, in, in the way that, he, that, he, that he, he commanded. But what we're seeing here is that's a hint of the world to come, right? You know, the, that the, um, this temple language foreshadows dwelling with the Lord forever and ever and ever. 
um, in, in, in the world to come. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's definitely in there. Hope in the Lord, dwelling with him, and that that foreshadowing of heaven. Let's get on to the next one. Um, and I, I'm moving I'm moving through these relatively fast because there is a lot of content and you know I'd like to get through it. Um, okay, 46. God is our hope and strength, a very present help in time of or a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear though the earth be moved and though the hills be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof rage and swell, and though the mountains shake at the tempest of the same, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle, the most highest. God is in the midst of her. Therefore, shall she not be removed. God shall help her and that right early. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. What do y'all think? Beautiful. <laughs> Go ahead, Delaney. I see your hand. <laughs> that one sounds more like the end, like Pharisee, when it's all sorted all out and everything's as it should be. Everything's screaming and happy and all is right, I guess. But it doesn't necessarily have to be at the end because it's predominantly talking about nature, I'd assume, talking about how all of it still cries out. So I guess in the reflection of the things to come, maybe. Yeah, there's a lot of garden language here. There's also a lot of temple language here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then this kind of goes back to, to some of the imagery that we see in the New Testament, um, how, how it relates to some of the Old Testament imagery um you know the, the the garden the garden of eden is a is a type of the temple right and which is also a type of the world to come um, we see that same garden and temple imagery all throughout revelation speaking about um when when everything is set to rights um in, in that final resurrection so yeah there's definitely there's definitely a lot of that going on there um a lot of confidence in god despite the troubles um and uh, and again that that temple and uh, and garden imagery that, that hints at heaven. Let's get to the next one, yeah. uh, one twenty one. Um, and unless you unless you had something else you wanted to add there, Randy. Well, I just was saying maybe it's referring to the same thing, uh, where that section where it says there is a river, the streams where make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle. Uh, to me, it kind of lists to heaven and to maybe even the new Jerusalem, like you were imagery and a picture of that, which, you know, I would think of in terms of, you know, eternal life and salvation. Yep, yep, I think that's, I think that's good. Okay, 121. Um, Can Bomber I add page. one more thing? Oh, sure, Tina. Um, I always, when this Psalm, I always read this Psalm, it's one of my favorite ones, but it reminds me also of what Jesus said, that rivers of living water will be flowing out of us. So- oh, good meaning where we have this this well of living within us and this you know this is that hope of of that eternal life that's already in us yeah excellent excellent observations very good uh bottom of 327 121 i will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help my help cometh even from the lord who hath made heaven and earth he will not suffer thy foot to be moved and he that keepeth thee will not sleep Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself is thy keeper. The Lord is thy defense upon thy right hand, so that the sun shall not burn thee by day, neither the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. Yea, it is even he that shall keep thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth forevermore. Okay, so how's this relate to resurrection and the burial of the dead? I like that part about the uh, uh, he shall keep thy soul. There's kind of a preservation there, not just here, but forever. I, I, and I, I think that's the main, yeah. I, I do think that's the main reason why it's included in our, in our, in our burial text. Um, you know, there, there's that preservation, that protection of the Lord extends beyond this life. And um, in our in our epistle that's coming up this coming week, um, you know, Paul speaks in those very terms about 
um, the Philippians salvation. So this, this is, yeah, God, God is the one who's going to keep us, you know, the author of our salvation is also the finisher of our salvation. Right. Is, is that, is that a hand Delaney? Yes. Sorry. Isn't there, and you just brought up the study. Didn't we just recently read somewhere about how there's not going to be a moon or a sun, but it's just going to be um, lit up by Jesus and his presence there. Um, I believe, mm. yeah, I believe that is, that was in this past week's um, epistle reading. I, uh, I, I, I didn't study for it since Father Jerry was going to be preaching. I was, I was lazy last week. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't pay attention as, to it as much as I probably should have. But yeah, I, I do believe that was in there. Um, it, you know, and that, and we are going to talk about how this relates to that feast of all saints and what we just celebrated. And really we are still celebrating as we're in the octave of it. So yeah, but that, that's, that's a good, um, that's a good observation. All right, let's move to the last Psalm, Psalm 130. Out of, this is on page 328. Out of the deep have I called unto thee, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. O let thine ears consider well the voice of my complaint. If thou, Lord, wilt be extreme to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who may abide it. For there is mercy with thee, therefore shalt thou be feared. I look for the Lord, my soul doth wait for him, in his word is my trust. My soul fleeth unto the Lord before the morning watch, I say before the morning watch. O Israel, trust in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his sins. What do y'all think? Well, when I when I think of that word redemption, I think you know salvation, eternal life, redeeming, plenteous redemption. Yep. Yeah. That's that's. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good observation there. Absolutely. There's there's those that, that promise of salvation, uh, Tina. Yeah, and the fact that it says in his word I, is my trust, that would lead us to faith, faith mm -hmm. in the trust of, of his promise of salvation. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, that those are the big, the big themes here, faith and trust and the salvation. We have that promise that God is listening, that God's forgiving. Uh, do, you, do you have something too, Mickey? Uh, at the beginning, when it says out of the depths or out of the deep, is that a reference to death? Or it could be a reference to just anything profound. I I think usually that's that's kind of talking about like the deep waters, um, you know, kind of ocean imagery, which is often tied to both extreme troubles and to death in Hebrew poetry. Because they, they, the 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 Hebrews were not seafaring people. Like the sea is a very scary thing to 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 the Hebrews. <laughs> you know, they didn't have they didn't. I mean, they 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 did go up to the Mediterranean. But I mean, the sea is where the invaders came from. The sea is where the mythical monsters were from, um, you know, the, the Leviathan and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I do think the deep, which, which is deep waters, um, is, is often a, a metaphor both for death and for just really, really bad trouble. Yeah, that's uh, good. Interesting uh, that he says out of the depths, if that's a reference to death, he says, I have called unto thee. We're not gonna be dead very long, only a split second and he's, right am i understanding the right there yeah and that's keep keep that yeah and keep that okay. thought as we okay. as we look at some of the, the upcoming prayers that's that's a good observation okay um that's a really good observation yeah yeah okay let's look at the lessons so so after we we have those opening sentences and then we have one or more of the selected psalms um uh, you can omit the Gloria Patri, which we usually do after the Psalms, except for at the very end. So uh, we're kind of diminishing the, the typical joy that we have in the Psalms because this is a funeral office. Even when we're focusing on the resurrection, it still is mourning. It still is, is, is burial of the dead. But then we have a choice of three, of uh, one or more of three lessons. So the first one is 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Um, and I think I'm not going to read the whole thing of, of any of these lessons. I think we're going to we're going to move, move on a little bit for the sake of time. But really, what we have in First Corinthians 15:20 through the through I think it's the end of the chapter 
is this extended discourse by St. Paul on the theology of the resurrection. Um, you know, he, he, he's talking about how because Christ was risen from the dead and he's the first fruits of them who slept and slept sleep in this context is a metaphor for death. It's a, it's a euphemism. Um, then we have that promise that we will be raised from the dead too. This is a challenge to um, all of Paul's primary audience at this point. Um, the Jews certainly believed in the resurrection of the dead, but they really didn't believe, they didn't expect that the Messiah was going to <laughs> die and, ra and rise again like we see in the New Testament. They, their concept of the resurrection was very much um, this general resurrection at the end of time, um, you know, when, when all shall rise uh, to, to judgment, you know, to the righteous to, to, to bliss, the, the, the unrighteous to torment. What they did not expect was that the Messiah would be the down payment of that promise. So they did expect resurrection, but they didn't expect it was anybody was going to get raised yet. <laughs> you know, that was the big surprise for, for the Jews. The Greeks, on the other hand, didn't expect resurrection at all. Resurrection is very much was was a, the whole idea of resurrection of the dead was completely foreign to the Greeks and other pagans of that time. Um, generally, they believed that the body was a prison to be escaped. Um, it, you know, and and they they while they did believe in the immortality of the soul you know, the resurrection of the body was just not on their radar. You know, you went to live with other souls, you know, not live, but kind of into an existence with other souls in Hades or some other thing. Um, and, you know, best case scenario, you kind of become one with the universe. <laughs> Worst case scenario, you're wandering around with the other shades down below. Um, but resurrection, not on their radar whatsoever. So that's a big challenge to them. And I would say it's also a challenge to us for the same reason. Um, most moderns don't really think about the resurrection of the body. Even, even a lot of Christians, though we might confess it in the creed, we don't think about it that way. As uh, N.T. Wright said in Surprised by Hope, which I think is probably, in my opinion, his best work, um, some of his stuff on justification, I think he's off base. Um, but Surprised by Hope is absolutely his, just, a, just an excellent book. As N.T. Wright likes to say, um, dying and going to heaven is not the end of the world. You know, the, <laughs> there's a lot more to the story than that, right? There is this promise of actual resurrection, um, of a physical bodily resurrection and a physical redemption of the world with a new heavens and a new earth. Um, you know, we, as moderns, we often don't think in those terms either, including modern Christians. We, we have a lot of that kind of Greek uh, Gnosticism in our, in our blood. Um, it, it has this, this phrase in here about um, the different kinds of body, the spiritual body versus the, uh, you know, the terrestrial body, celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies, that sort of thing. Um, you will find a minority um, of theologians that do see that being a, a dichotomy between spiritual and physical. Um, if anybody has read David Bentley Hart, that's his big thing. Um, frankly, that's, that's just not right <laughs> in the context of the rest of the New Testament. I mean, you have to basically take this chapter out of context with everything else Paul says, everything else the New Testament says to come to that conclusion. Um, Rather, the way we should look at that is that, um, that 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 resurrection body is physical, but it's not mortal. It's not subject to corruption. It's not subject to sin, sickness, death, all those consequences of a fall. But rather, we have a glorified body, just like our Lord had when he rose. Um, and exactly what the parallels are between our, the way the things that our Lord did post-resurrection and what we will be capable of we're not really sure i mean there's that's that's a big foggy area that the scriptures just don't really reveal but um you know that glorified body is what he's talking about not a you know fake 
not physical body. You know, bodies are physical. That's just the way they are. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, 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 um, that's what he's talking about here. Uh, comments, questions on this passage, or and we can go to the next one otherwise. Well, I was going to say that, you know, I just wanted to affirm uh, probably uh, for a long time, I thought about, you know, eternal life is kind of floating in the air and with the angels, things like that. But I, I last several years, I've been hearing more people talk about what we might be able to like, expect, you know, in that new heaven and new earth and even activities and things we might be doing in the body and, and much more conscious of the fact that it is a body that we're going to be uh, looking at. Resurrection, resurrection. I read a book, uh, Randy Alcorn. Does that name ring a bell? He's got. Uh, it does not. Not to me. He's got a very <laughs> real thick, uh, detailed book that he. Uh, some people, others have read it. They thought he went maybe tried to put too much in it, but it was it was kind of interesting reading that one. But uh, very good. All right. Well, let's look at the next passage. Um, this is Romans eight beginning at verse 14, uh, page 330 and 331. Um, so again, kind of, we're not gonna read the whole thing, but it does um, kind of hang out on, on the idea of redemption and especially Jesus as the first fruits of our redemption. And so this is getting into more of that concept of all of creation um, is waiting for redemption, not just us. Again, challenging those those Greek ideas as well as a lot of our ideas. You know, um, well, one fine morning when this life was over, I'll fly away. No, that's not what Scripture says. I mean, it's it's a it's a fun hymn, <laughs> or it's a great it's a great song. I mean, we we all there, there's it, it tugs on the heartstrings, but it's it's theologically anemic. We're not going to escape this world like 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 flying from prison. Rather, um, it's going to be changed. Creation groans, waiting for our redemption, because creation knows that when we're redeemed, its redemption is coming too. You know, new heavens and a new earth, and it's not even you know when we look at Revelation, it's not that that earth is caught up into heaven. Rather, it's heavens coming down into earth. That marriage between heaven and earth is is um, the city of the king coming down to earth and sanctifying it. Um, so, but we also have in here this famous passage: "We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose." What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Um, Christ's resurrection is not only the promise of our resurrection, but it's also promise of new life, period, a new life that does begin now. You know, we, we, we're getting a taste of glory now um, as, we, as we walk in the spirit. So um, yeah, that's, that's a neat passage as well. Um, no condemnation was to say, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Um, we know that uh, when we're in Christ, there is no condemnation, not because of our goodness, but because of his. Um, so we have confidence in God, even when we're in extreme troubles and even when we're facing our death. So that's, that's Romans 8, 14. Uh, questions, comments on that passage? And then if not, we'll go on to John 14. Well, you know, Father Isaiah, I was, that same chapter, I, I was thinking about that. That's meant a lot where that the creation itself, you know, over farther on, uh, verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Uh, because the creation itself also will be delivered yep. from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. And yeah, that's really one of my absolute there. favorite passages. I mean, it's, it's just a great, deep passage that um, who knows what the heck that looks like, but it's, uh, it's going to be great. All right, let's look at John 14. So this is our this is our last passage here. And this is probably the one in my experience that most folks want um, when they're when they're preparing either their funeral or the funeral for their loved ones. 
Um, John 14, beginning at the first verse, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we have that, that promise of heaven, that promise that the Lord is preparing a place for us, that promise that, um, that he will not only make the way, but that he is the way uh, to the Father. Um, and the promise of the second coming, too. So, so we, we, have, we have it all the way around there. I was thinking for Sean 5.13 uh, this last week came up, you know. I think God wants us to have assurance. Uh, yeah. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think that's that's very important. Um, absolutely. Okay, let's turn the page uh, 332. We have the concluding prayers of the office itself, and I do think I'm going to have to spill this over to the next to the, to the next one because there's a lot to um, to look at here. Um, oh, and before before we 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 do, uh, there is there is a a rubric that allows for a hymn or an anthem. Um, inserting the creed, the Lord's Prayer, um, or, or other things there. So there is a lot of flexibility to this office. Almost always we end up doing the Lord's Prayer there in an, in an anthem when we're doing, doing a funeral office, often the creed as well. Um, th this could be a very short service, like 15, 20 minutes, but you can kind of drag it out, you know, to closer to 45, 30 or 45. Um, okay, so top of, back to top of page uh, 332. Um, so we have this prayer, remember thy servant, O Lord, according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people, and grant that, increasing in knowledge and love of thee, he may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Okay, this is interesting. Um, this prayer that he would go from strength to strength. Um, is, is, is that an implied prayer for the dead? What do y'all think? And, and why or why not? <laughs> well, you know, continuing on, it says, thy heavenly kingdom. So it would seem like in the context there that talking about, you know, into the heavenly kingdom. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to escape this, this certainly, this certainly does seem to be um, a, a prayer for the dead. Um, that, that's, it, it, this, this particular prayer has, has its roots in some older prayers. Um, I, I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head and I, and I forgot to write down um, the exact, the exact antecedents, but, um, there, there does seem to be a very natural impulse, um, that we would pray for those who pray for those who have gone before. The question really is, what does this mean? What does this look like? Um, I think probably for me, the best image when I picture this is from C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle, that, that final book in the Chronicles of Narnia, where when they are in, basically it's it's heaven, um, you know they're they're in this this Narnia that's re more real than the than the real Narnia than what they knew before kind of thing. It's like almost oh yeah that 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 Narnia that we knew it's not really what this is. This is so much more. It's more real than that was. You know things are brighter and bigger and better. And then as they go up, they find out oh there's another one. And they go into further up. They keep saying, "Okay, let's go further up and further in." And and it's and the the image that he kind of concludes the story with is this perpetual growth to something even better and better and better, um, which which doesn't make a lot of sense to us because eternity doesn't make a lot of sense to us. You know, we think in finite terms, not eternal terms. But 
we are finite beings and God is not. Um, T -t Tina, you're, you're a mathematician, right? Um, uh, uh, the, uh, what, what does it call? It's kind of like half a parabola. Is that a limit? Half a parabola? Are you, you know, it's, 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 it's the one where it kind of just goes up forever and ever and ever, but it never quite reaches the point. It has a okay, starting so point, but then it, you know, it's not, it's not a full parabola. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, kind of. And so the, the idea being is that on the graph, you know, there's a point that you're aiming towards, but you never get there. It's this, right. it's this infinite, infinite progression approaching that point. Um, if God is infinite, that's, that's probably what we have to look forward to. We will never reach his, we will never fully understand him because to understand him, we'd have to be infinite and we're not. Mm -hmm. So we will have eternity to get to know him better and better and better and better. At least that's kind of the picture I have in my head. And, and again, I do think Lewis's um, imagery from the last battle paints, paints that picture really well, um, at, least, at least in my mind. Matt? Uh, did you mean an asymptote? The, the line it I could guess, be. It's been so, almost, so long. It gets closer and closer to reaching a, a point, but never reaches it. Yeah, and it, it kind of looks like it's yeah. curved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, asymptote. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's yes, what you meant. You. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. I'm a liberal arts major, and I haven't hit, hit that <laughs> stuff in about almost uh, 30 years at this point. <laughs> okay, so the asymptote is the line that the graph tries to get to and never can reach. So if that's yeah, what you're yeah. talking about, then it is, but it's not an actual line on the graph. It's like an imaginary line. Right, right. So yeah, and the, the, maybe the, that is the what curve, you're thinking about. What's the about. curved line called? Not that this matters at all. But well, there, there's, there's lots of them. I mean, there's different graphs. So, um, I mean, it could be that you're thinking about, you know, certain graphs of polynomials because some of them do, um, you know, go forever. I'm, you know, they do obviously, but um, the ones with asymptotes are the rational functions that have like a denominator that can't equal zero. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> Again, it's been, beyond, it's been so time. very long since I've, I've done these things. <laughs> back when we were using our graphing calculators to play hangman and Tetris um, <laughs> in, in, in the 90s. So I guess not quite 30 years, probably 25. At any rate, um, then we have this, this final prayer after, after that one um, that um, says, unto God's gracious mercy and protection, we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and evermore. Amen. And it's, 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 a, little, it's a little unclear as to who the you is in this last prayer of the, of the, of the burial office, of the office proper, because we're, we're not yet at the grave. Um, it does... It does seem that that you includes the deceased. Um, I mean, it just, just linguistically, it, it seems to be that way. Um, so, so, so that that does conclude that does conclude the the office, and and I do think a big part of you know because we we have this hope of the resurrection, and so we can entrust our loved one to the Lord. Um, and that, that's, that's a big part of, of what, we're, what we're doing with the burial office. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to stop getting, going at new stuff here. We'll, we'll take the at the grave next week. But um, yeah, let's, let's, let's open for any, any additional, uh, hopefully non-mathematical discussion at, uh, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> This is a good good preparation for me. Like I mentioned, Friday I'll be going to the uh, Houston for a funeral and burial, and this is uh, really helpful. The uh, burial is for my uh, uh, cousins uh, who lives in Harmony Hills, right in our neighborhood, uh, and oh, her wow. her, uh, her daughter's husband just passed away from cancer. Uh, but uh, it was interesting because. Uh, her daughter taught he, he died on All Saints Day. 
And uh, she was very impressed by the fact that he would die on that day. Mm. And it was a sort of implication that of, uh, he would see the face of God. And I've noticed that, I think you were mentioning, Father Isaac, that it seems to me like the Catholic Church has tried to move toward more, a little more assurance in some of the experiences of having it as versus, you know, the purgatory uh, emphasis, maybe. Yeah, and, and again, for, for most, most Roman Catholics today, um, I mean, like, like well-informed Catholics, they still do believe in purgatory, but purgatory is a function of assurance for them rather than a, a source of dread like it would have been in the Middle Ages. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and, and, there, there, and there has been, frankly, something of a Protestantizing of, of the church since Vatican II. I mean, they, they, the Protestant ideas have, have entered into some of that Catholic thinking. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that they've flip-flopped, but that has informed the way they look at some of their doctrines. And I think there are some areas where they flip-flop. They disagree with me on that. But um, I, I, think, I think, Matt, Matt you, had, you had something on, on those. Yeah, uh, I know there's like the Eastern traditions, they have the bell towers. Uh, it's not official doctrine, but it's, uh, you know, it's something they, they believe that there is some kind of trial of the soul before you reach, I guess you reach God. So I just kind of, I find it kind of interesting, you know, both, both, you know, those traditions kind of have an idea of that, even though I don't think it's it should really be the emphasis, but, you know, I just always thought that was kind of interesting that they, they had that kind of a viewpoint. And, and I haven't really been able to get a clear picture of what um, the bell towers are. Sometimes I've heard them called toll houses, which always makes me think of cookies um, in, the, uh, in, in the Eastern church. And, and I think some of that's because since it isn't... Um, kind of in stone doctrine there's a lot more kind of suppositional writing than real clear writing from them and that's 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 often very very common among the east they they don't they don't pin things down as readily as the west does um but but yeah there there is there's a certain thing um you know and i i kind of think that you know the death itself is that purgation. Um, you know, we, we, we get purified because we're going through death. Um, certainly, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be who I am now when I'm before the Lord in terms of certain of those, those flaws, those sins, um, all those sorts of things, those are going to be gone. Um, you know, and, and, the point, the point being that we can be assured in Christ that we're going to be be before the Lord in heaven, and and I think even a well well informed Roman Catholics would agree that the medieval way that purgatory was described was really a gross misrepresentation of God's grace. Like it just was not showing God's grace at all. <laughs> I mean, it was it was pretty bad. So um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's it, it is very interesting. Uh, and we'll talk about some more of that next week as well, um, in terms of in terms of kind of how how some of that plays into into our things because we are going to see that that's that that natural liturgical urge to in some way pray for the dead. Um, it shows up a lot more often than I had remembered, um, you know, before I started kind of studying for tonight's class. So, all right. Well, I think I'm going to stop the recording. I don't have to stop the um the zoom but i will i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording god bless y'all